Hello. Thank you, Alex, so much. That was perfect. <laughs> you totally nailed it. Um, I am so honored to receive this award uh, and, and so happy that it uh, gave me the chance to visit Ireland. My only other trip here was with President Obama in 2011, where I spent the entire time making speech edits in a windowless office that could have just as easily been in Dublin, Ohio. I honestly wouldn't have known the difference at all. And I'm especially excited to be here on St. Patrick's Day weekend. I also want to thank whoever changed the time of this event from 5 p.m. to 3 p.m. so I could avoid the embarrassment of speaking to a completely empty room. Uh, we're not as big on rugby in the United States, but I can tell you if that my Boston Red Sox were in the World Series and David Ortiz was retiring today, I'd already be five beers deep at the nearest pub. So, so I won't go on too long for you guys. Um, like most people who uh, put words together for a living, uh, I have loved and hated writing um, for as long as I can remember. But I didn't connect writing with politics and speeches until right after college. I took a job as an entry level uh, assistant on John Kerry's presidential campaign, and by chance, uh, I ended up sitting next to his chief speechwriter. I thought he had the greatest job in the world. I also thought it was the kind of job that other people did. People who are older, smarter, and more connected. So I just worked hard, I kept my head down, and I tried to learn as much as I could from him. And one day, I finally got the courage to ask if I could be his deputy speechwriter. And he immediately said no. <laughs> but then one day after that, when the campaign was almost broke and couldn't afford to hire a real speechwriter, I became the most affordable option. So a few months later, when John Kerry accepted the Democratic nomination for president at the 2004 convention in Boston, I was assigned the task of making sure that all the convention speeches reflected the message of the Kerry campaign. And one day, I get a call from our chief speechwriter who told me that there was a problem with the draft keynote address being given by the young state senator from Illinois, Barack Obama. Apparently, Obama had written a line in his keynote that John Kerry wanted to use in his acceptance speech. So I was told that I had to go introduce my 23-year-old self to Obama and personally ask him to change the line in his speech the day before he delivered it. Thanks a lot, boss. Um, so I sheepishly walked into the room where Obama was practicing his speech, mumbled something about the line, and then blacked out for a few seconds. And when I came to, Obama was glaring down at me within an inch of my face, and he said, are you seriously trying to tell me that I have to take out my favorite line in this speech? So great first impression with my future boss. Totally nailed it. And you know, at that point, I figured uh, I would never talk to Barack Obama again. Uh, and that was too bad, because when I heard his keynote the next night, I thought it represented everything that was missing from politics. For so long, I had been used to hearing politicians speak in the same sound bites and cliches, rattling off a checklist of issues that polled well, but came off flat and sounded sort of phony. But Barack Obama told a story that night. He linked his prob improbable journey with America's and painted a vivid picture of a more hopeful future. It was honest, it was authentic. For the first time in the whole campaign, I was sure we would win and make a real difference in people's lives. And then John Kerry lost. And I was crushed. I was 23 years old, but I became desperately cynical about politics and what it could do. I wanted to give it all up, and at that point I sort of had to because I was completely broke. So broke that when I drove home to Boston to move back in with my parents, I didn't have enough money to pay the last toll on the highway and had to speed right through the light. <laughs> so that was rock bottom. Then a couple of weeks later, I received an email that changed my life. One of my bosses from the Kerry campaign was now a top aide to Senator Barack Obama and told me that he was looking to hire his very first speechwriter. My interview with Obama was surprisingly easy. We talked about our families and where we grew up. We talked about why we got into politics. But most of all, we didn't talk about the line that I took out of his convention speech <laughs> because he didn't remember it was me. And at the end of the conversation, he said something I'll never forget. He said, well, I still don't think I need a speechwriter, but you seem nice enough, so let's give this a shot. <laughs> and that's how I got the job. So, 
For eight years, I had the chance to learn about writing from one of the very best. I can still remember the night I left the office to write my very first Obama speech. He yelled after me, Favs, I know it's your first speech, and I know you're probably worried, and I know you're probably anxious, but know this, I'm a writer too. Sometimes the muse strikes, sometimes it doesn't. Things don't work out, come in tomorrow, and the two of us will work through it together. And that's how he was for eight years. The president taught me more than I could have ever imagined about writing and storytelling. He taught me that crafting a simple, logical argument was more important than a snappy slogan or a catchy applause line. He taught me that shorter is always better, reminding me more than once that Abraham Lincoln fit the Gettysburg address on the back of a napkin. He taught me the value of honesty and authenticity in writing. After delivering one of the most candid, heartfelt, politically risky speeches on race in America, he said to me, I don't know if you can get elected president saying the things I did about race today. But I also know that I don't deserve to be president if I don't say the things that I believe. But I think the most important lesson that I learned from President Obama was about the power of storytelling to instill a sense of hope and why that's so important right now. We live in very cynical times. And that's partly because we are constantly being fed a steady stream of bad news. Scan the headlines on any given day and you're bound to see story after story about a problem that can't be solved, a war that won't end, a disease we can't cure, a plane we can't find, a politician, a celebrity, or CEO who has lied or cheated or let us down in any number of ways. These stories are real, mostly, and the media keeps feeding us these headlines because we click on them. But as a consequence, we don't get enough good news. We don't hear as much about the hundreds of millions around the world who've been lifted from extreme poverty since the turn of the century. We don't hear about declining crime rates or reduction in HIV infections or the billions who've gained access to clean water and basic sanitation thanks to the generosity and commitment of the global community. It doesn't make the front pages when someone's life is saved because she finally could afford health insurance for the first time or when a poor child escapes a bad neighborhood thanks to a dedicated teacher. The news will record every instance of a public figure's mistakes, but it cannot possibly capture the daily, countless examples of ordinary men and women who show kindness to a stranger, or forgiveness when wronged, or love without condition. And the news simply does not have the capacity to fully chronicle the slow, painful, and often frustrating pace that real peace and progress has always required. That's why we need storytelling that instills a sense of hope. And that's a job for the world's writers and poets, for its artists and dreamers, for its students and activists and youthful idealists of every age. The people of Ireland understand this better than most. Despite a long legacy of hardship and adversity, or more likely because of it, this small island has produced an incredible number of history's greatest storytellers, who were today celebrated as some of your greatest heroes. Joyce, Beckett, Swift, Shaw, Wilde, Yeats, Haney, and of course those courageous Irish monks who rescued our civilization stories from the Dark Ages. Like these proud ancestors and so many other graduates of UCD, I know that many of you will go on to make an indelible impact on our world. And the best advice I can give you is this. Whatever change you want to bring about, whatever career you want to pursue, whatever cause you want to champion, don't let anyone else's cynicism be your excuse for not trying. After that disappointing election in 2004, I can still remember the moment when I finally let go of that cynicism. It was the night of the 2008 election, but it wasn't when they called the race for Barack Obama. It was before that, as I was making final edits to the victory speech. The draft ended with a story we found about a woman from Atlanta, Georgia, named Ann Nixon Cooper, who had waited in line for three hours that day to cast her ballot. And what made the story so special was that Ann Nixon Cooper was 106 years old, born at a time when she wasn't allowed to vote for two reasons, because she was a woman and because she was African-American. 
So we ended the speech by tracing all the seemingly impossible change she had witnessed over the course of her life. Civil rights, voting rights, workers' rights, women's rights. Now, as they started calling the states on election night, someone pointed out to me that we should probably contact Ann Nixon Cooper and find out if she's okay with Barack Obama telling her story. So our campaign researchers dig up her number and I give her a call. And I tell this frail 106-year-old woman that a man who was about to become the first African-American president of the United States wanted to mention her in his victory speech. And she paused for a while, and then she said, will it be on television? <laughs> and I told her, yes, it would be on television. And then she thought about that for a while, and she asked me, which channel will it be on? <laughs> and I said, all the channels. <laughs> and then she said, I'm so proud of him, and I'm so proud of us. And she started to cry. And at that point, so did I. And right at that moment, they called Ohio, the race was over, everyone started cheering, and I hid under my desk so I could talk to Ann Nixon Cooper for a few more minutes. Seamus Haney once said, if you have the words, there's always a chance that you'll find the way. On their own, hopeful stories and writing that inspires can't solve the world's problems or shield us from the hardship and heartache that's just part of life. But by reminding us of the progress we've made in the past and the possibilities that exist in the future, words can guide us, push us forward, and at the very least, encourage us to try. Thank you very much for this honor, and I'm very happy to take your questions. <laughs>